Hello and welcome to another episode of CNBC's Beyond the Valley. I'm Arjun Kapoor here in London and I'm not going to give you a big long intro here. I want to get right into our conversation because it's a fascinating one on the future of the web, on data uh, and where we all go from here. And I want to introduce my two wonderful guests today, John Bruce, the CEO of Inrupt and Sir Tim Berners-Lee, the co-founder of Inrupt and of course the inventor of the World Wide Web, just a small mention there. Um, I just want to kick off the conversation on a, on a broader theme with you two here. Um, there's been a lot of discussion about the state of the web as it stands, what the current internet landscape is like. What are the current problems with the web as you see it right now? John, I'll come to you first, um, as you see it. Uh, and what are some of the steps that, in your view, need to be taken to fix it? Well, uh, I, I can talk about the experiences I'm facing as I go around and about the world, talking to corporations and governments about the challenges they're experiencing. And the common denominators are we've got to a place where and we see this on, the, on a macro basis on the web, but, but on a more particular basis, we see entities that sit astride silos of data or consolidation of data in a way that's not practical. And, and the consequence of which is that citizens and consumers, you and I, Tim, and everybody else around here, you know, we don't get the value out of the web that we could. Our data is held in places that are not accessible to us and the utility of it is lost. I mean, the data is used for the benefit of others, not the citizen or the consumer. And inversely, corporations are and governments are challenged by the consequences of assembling all these pots of data about individuals, but not combining them in a way that provides utility for them as entities that want to provision the service or the product. Or inversely, the citizen, the consumer, who wants to enjoy a relationship with all these entities that's productive, that gets utility out of their data. So. So what fascinates me most about the opportunity to do our bit to change that is that it's available to us. All the data exists. It's just a recomposition of it, making it available in a form that isn't available today for the benefit of everybody. I mean, it, it's a, a truly consequential change we can make. Organizations, individuals, and the people who glue it together, the developers, can all operate in a way which is way more efficient than the way we have today. And, uh, and, and I... You know, Tim and I uh, enjoy the, the opportunity to, to make a significant difference here. So, so that's why Enrup. But. And you spoke a little bit about the, the sort of the amount of data that, that, and, and sort of hinting towards, I guess, what we see now is a landscape in the Internet where there are large players, large players of this world. Uh, you look at the Googles and Amazons and Facebooks of this world, which, of course, collect large amounts of data for their products or on users. Um, Tim, this question to you, I mean... What, what are the challenges then as it stands with the, with the internet landscape as it is, given the sort of dominance of a lot of these large players um, and the data they're co collecting? What are you concerned about at the moment? So I suppose um, one way to think about this is to go back. So I mentioned the were 33 or odd years ago. And back then, uh, if you were sufficiently switched on and geeky, you could get yourself a computer and you could put a web server on it. You could plug it into the internet and you could, you'd have a website. So anybody could have a website. Uh, not everybody had, had the internet back then, but that the spirit of the web was incredibly empowering to individuals because you could put your website up and you know CNBC could put its website up, the Financial Times could put its website up, and you as an individual could, and you'd all you could all link to each other, and the blogosphere in a way was this feeling, uh, this tremendous feeling of individual personal sovereignty. My website is up, right up there. It's got I've got my domain name, and now I have power the same power as all these big companies. What's gone wrong with that picture? Well, everybody's on, everybody's on Facebook. So now they don't have the website. They all use Mark Zuckerberg's website. And, and on there, a few things are wrong. Partly it's innovation. You know, what, when people had their own websites and they wrote their own code to, and tweaked their own websites, you know, it was crazy, all kinds of things. And then people tried to make, you know, there was my, MySpace where you, could, where you could have quite varied spaces, but then on, uh, what happens on Facebook, you don't, con you don't, when people look you up on Facebook, you don't control actually what they see. You don't control, Mark Zuckerberg's algorithms control what news gets fed to them as they're looking at your stuff and so on. And so that, uh, that's very disempowering. It's very useful to Facebook. They have a lot of data about people that they, do, they use for 
targeting them with advertisements, in particular political ad advertisements and other famous ones. But what we've lost is the ability for individuals to have power. So, look, so, so, so stepping back, can you imagine? So if Web 2.0 is this sort of rather dysfunctional one, where you have these huge silos, we have just Facebook, where everything happens inside Facebook, and, and um, sort of Google, where everything happens in Google, but and LinkedIn, where everything happens in LinkedIn, but you can't actually share your link, you can't share your Facebook photos with your LinkedIn groups because your group, these groups aren't first class objects on the web. They're, they're, they aren't, they don't have URLs. You can, you know, a LinkedIn group is only a thing within LinkedIn, a Facebook group is only a thing within Facebook. So that's actually, when people think about it, they realize actually, yeah, I'm, you know, that's a pain. I would prefer a world in which I could just share across the platform. So what we're doing is we're, so the third version of this, if you like, Web 3.0, not computers, but Web 3. But Web 3.0, the third layer of the web, is we just have some more protocols. We've got, we, we've got, still have HTML. We still have HTTP. We add some, we have the RDF data format. We had, uh, we had, uh, basically, we had a single sign-on across the web. So if you have a, uh, the project called Solid, and if you sign on, log on with a Solid project, well, <coughs> identity that good anywhere so it's like not in, you don't have to choose whether it's logging with Facebook or logging with Google logging with solid and it works everywhere in a way that's obviously useful obviously we ought to have that and so the, just giving universal sign-on is one thing and and then when you then you get you give everybody a little bit of cloud storage their own personal cloud storage mm -hmm. call it a solid pod they have complete control over that it's a bit like a Dropbox account it's a bit like a box it's a bit like a G drive in a way, uh, but it runs the solid protocol. And the neat thing about the solid protocol, the really sort of the massive innovation here, is that when you run, if if you have your solid pod, which runs this protocol, runs the solid protocol, then any app can run data right into it. So the moment it's, if I run a writing app, it would be a total pain for me to write the code to store stuff on G drive or store stuff in Dropbox. But so what we're doing is we're saying there's a new world in which. When the app, when you run an app, it asks you where you want to store your data, and you say which pod you want to put in, and then all the data in your life goes into that pod, and that is really enabling. Yeah, and there's the yin and the yang of Inrupt, actually, yeah. which is the personal empowerment, and the uh, you know the 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 opportunity for individuals to take more command over their role on the web, and the utility for enterprises and governments, organizations to service the users in a much more productive way for everybody, right? So, so it's, that, it's a fascinating blend, actually, a really potent blend of two hugely, uh, I think, potent opportunities to make a significant difference on the web coming together to, for the benefit of everybody. Solid is a protocol. It's an open protocol. It's, uh, you go to WCC, to, to the Solid Working Group, uh, and Solid Community Group uh, to discuss it. So Solid is, is the open standard. Interrupt is a company which has a whole bunch of very good pro products which implement the, the... Right. Okay, Solid is the platform, the open platform. So Interrupt yeah. is a company. So Timothy it, 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 yeah. uh, created it at MIT. Went yeah. to, so just a bit of background if you like, but, but Tim and I met, I don't know, six years ago or something, yeah. when he was a professor at MIT and he'd been working for some years mm. on this project called Solid. And Solid was a way of taking the constructs of the web and by reorienting them, getting us to a way better place. Uh, and for my part, I was at IBM and, and, uh, and uh, I guess I, uh, Tim and I met and, and, and the notion was we could move the center of gravity of Solid somewhat out of MIT, continue to invest greatly in the open source efforts, but at the self same time, put a resource set, which we called Inrupt, a company together, with capital and people and a roadmap and, and so on to, to galvanize the efforts, to take it from a, I guess you'd say, an open source prototypical way that the web could work and by building an enterprise grade version of it all, make it safely and scalably available to governments and massive organizations who wanted to get utility out of the web, out of the data that's available on the web, yeah. in a way that was much more productive for everybody. So, so, so we came together to do that. And how do you get buy-in then? I understand from a government perspective, but as a, as a private company, 
um, you know, who thrive on data collection in order to improve their products, and they thrive and, and, and really want to own that data. Right. How do you then get buy-in from companies so, like that when that has been the business model that's been prevalent? Therein lies the rub, right? Thrive is an interesting word. I mean, I think corpora the corporations we find ourselves talking to, uh, uh, you know, they realize that the road they're on, this endless trudge to get more data, to, to look for the slivers of intelligence, to figure out the propensity to purchase of, of a possible buyer of their product or service, that, that is a sliding scale of return on investment, right? We're in the margins of the margins when it comes to return on that kind of investment. But everybody's so myopically looking at this whole, you know, trudge we're on, that when you say, can we just, you know, sorry, Americanism, can, can we just take a breather here? Because there's another way of doing this stuff if we're prepared to engage the process to get there. And, and, and the other way of doing it is instead of, you know, figuring out blindly, is a... Uh, are you the likely candidate for my product or service? How about I just ask you in a legitimate way and you tell me? I'm oversimplifying it somewhat, but, but not greatly, actually. So this notion of engaging your potential consumers in a collaborative way to determine what they want to buy and when they want to buy it and how much they want to pay for it and so on is way better than, than trying to speculatively determine based on your height, weight, where you live, what your car is, whether or not you're going to buy my bike. I, I, you so, know, I have a simple event, so much so. For example, suppose you're a travel agent and at the moment, right, and you're on the web and you're trying to sell vacations, holidays to people. And uh, at the moment what you do is you put out ads and you, you've got this great holiday which you think will apply to a particular demographic. So you go to Facebook and you get these, tar uh, these ads which are amazingly targeted, just the sort of people you ask. And so they see the ads. But uh, sort of flip side, so in the... You know, in, with the solid world, then somebody decides that they want a, a really good holiday next year and they chat to the family and they go onto the web. This is, uh, if you like, this is flipped around, this is the intention economy, not the attention economy, they call it. This is somebody comes to the, goes to the travel agent and said, all right, we had a pretty good vacation last time, but and we've had, a, we've had three uh, vacations, last, but, but actually we want something kind of special and really, really different. And, and so, and, uh, and by the way, we can give you, we can open up the solid pod with all of the pictures we've taken at all of our holidays. We've got all of the flights that we took. We've got all of the, uh, of the reviews we left on all the restaurants. We've got all of the menus that we took in data in our pod. And, you know, s suppose for 24 hours, you get access to all that. You're, you, run, you run your AI on our data. You find it's a brilliant holiday, and then you forget it. So that's so you're empowering when the individuals got all this stuff about their lives. They're very very empowered by it. And that as a, if you're you know if you're a travel agent or whatever you are, then you then you're, you you do well to actually sort of flip over to the, the, this and enjoy the world where the the users give you offering much so much more data than you ever get from Facebook. Tim, in your view, how much of the success of this uh, and this really taking off is predicated on the change in user behavior? Because right now, uh, and also how much do users really want to take responsibility for their data? Right now, we go through this process. We go to a website. We accept or reject cookies or, uh, you know, we can tinker with some sort of uh, privacy uh, settings on whatever app we're using to say, don't collect this data. or don't. And, you know, there are options there. It takes a lot of effort. I'm sure most people don't do it. Um, even though the option's there. So how much, I mean, is it about changing consumer behavior and how much are you seeing that behavior and that willingness to change? There will be a huge change of behavior, but it won't happen from us standing up on the wall and saying, hey, June the 1st, everybody, you know, everybody, you know, drop Facebook, drop Instagram, drop Google. Okay, it's bit by bit. Yeah. Things change. And in you know, we never actually did any some marketing. We did, but as we started the company, people realized what we were doing. They, we got incoming interest. We got incoming interest from the NHS in Manchester. Mm -hmm. uh, we got incoming interest from the, from the Flanders government. And the Flanders government said, you know what? The, you know, the, the, the head, their minister, minister president, had said to a camera, everybody in Flanders should have control of their own data. 
because because of GDPR and because of a more efficient economy, and we want and post COVID, we have uh, this country, this region has got to pick up fast, and it's got to be very efficient. So we want to have all of the data, personal data, to be very interoperable across across the government and across com companies. So he so he had that vision about that. Actually, it was important for the for his citizens, and that's and that what's going to happen. Everyone, what's happening now is they're rolling it out. It, Bit by bit, different government services will actually use the pod. The and people will log in with a government ID. Actually, it's a solid ID. Actually, it's working other things. In fact, they'll find the pod is actually pretty useful for doing other things. But it doesn't matter. It'll be bit by bit. And so the web originally it spread. Um, it spread. It didn't spread suddenly. Everybody switching to it. It spread among high energy physicists because those are the people who paid our salaries. It's, and it moved. It went. So it started off at CERN and it moved across to high energy physics lab in. Um, in the States and nobody else knew about it. Then it moved to the local library there and then moved into the libraries. And so, and in fact, every time the web spread by sort of by another factor of 10, it spread for a different reason. And the same thing is with solid. So, but, but, but except that, you know, with the web, if you get something grows by a factor of 10 every year, then in 10 years, you've got 10 to the 10, you've got the planet, more or less. And we've done that, been there, got done that, got t shirt. And but, well, it's happening. We can't afford to wait ten years for solid. But you know, the farmers government comes to us and says, "Can you we, can we give everybody solid as a pod?" We go, "Yep, that works." So governments. So we've got this incoming stream of governments. Uh, other guys. Corporations the same as well. But but the principle of your question is, I mean, first we have to start with the binary question, right? Should users have control of their data or not? Well, in our world, you should. You should have control of your data. I mean, it's your data and. Uh, so having said, yep, the principle is absolutely a sound one. Users should be in control of their data. Now the question is, how do we get you there? How do we get you there in a way where it's not a step function in your behavior? And, 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 and that takes steps. So the corporations we're working with appreciate, and governments do, but the corporations appreciate that we can't change everything overnight. Your user buying behavior, user interaction with organizations has to evolve. So, so what motivates them to, 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 to behave in a particular way? Incentives. And I don't mean pay you to do it, but rather show you some experience of a, of a new way that you, as an individual, could enjoy a relationship with a provider that's better than the one you've got today, and you're going to adopt it. Mm. And having adopted it, and then it moves on again, you'll continue to adopt it. So that progression from where we are to where we're going to do, that's, that's what we're working on with corporations. It's not an overnight change. It's, it's moving towards an end state. And along this journey, how much of a challenge, John, is it when we are getting into an, a world of increasing tensions geopolitically and where blocks and governments around the world are becoming, to some extent, technologically more sure. siloed? Yeah, yeah. Particularly with data, you have to store the data in this jurisdiction. You have to store. Yep. What challenge does that pose to this kind of, you know, arena where you want users to be more control of their data, but you also want it to be somewhere that there's able to kind of, you know, share data willingly yep. Yep. Um, and across the world and for any product and service. Yep. Well, I think the more li there are more likely landing zones for change than others. And I'm not, I don't mean to imply any disrespect for, you know, we, we might name names together uh, where it's less likely to be adopted than others, uh, other territories. But, but the ones we're engaged in today are, are classic democracies who see the, the merit, the virtue in giving their citizens control over their wherewithal on the web. And, and they want to make that available to them. And corporations with a brand were part of their, their brand is trust. And, and, you know, if, if you're a CFO of a corporation, you can somewhat make a, a, a hard determination between the increase in trust perception of your consumers and the return on your investment. I mean, you know, it's, uh, there's a science to all this stuff. So, so, so by, by virtue of deploying a technology, as, as companies are now beginning to, where the, you're demonstrating to your consumers that you appreciate their trust, the, the, and you don't just say it, you walk, you walk the talk, you, you, get a, you get a profound shift in the relationship you've got with your consumers where your brand, which is already hopefully somewhat measurably trusted, becomes increasingly trusted. Interesting. As we talk about 
the the future and makeup of the web. Tim, I want to get your view on this as well. You meant because you mentioned earlier Web three and Web three point oh. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, talking about a difference here. Um, when when people are discussing what the future of of the web looks like in in the uh, the the future, they often use these terms interchangeably, um, and uh, they're quite ill defined as they stand at the moment. So. Web 3.0, you mentioned, Tim. What does that mean to you? Well, what does it look like? So that's Web 3.0. Sorry, is, is, is uh, the third layer of the web, we call it. Yeah, I mean, the layers like this, the protocol layers, like, uh, if you like, solid is the, uh, the solid protocol, it's, it's the, the seventh layer of the web, if you like. This application is pro the, the geeks will be talking about the layers of the protocol stack uh, and uh, sort of the the transport layer and the network layer and so on, and uh, those are deep in the, uh, and then, but the, the layer seven is the application layer where, where we actually provide functionality by getting people to be able to use the same data on different apps. Mm -hmm. That's where, that solid is, it's just, it's, it just, it's, it's much of standard, it's nothing to do with blockchain. Okay, yeah. now I'm sorry, you've, Gavin was here, right? He, he, he wrote a blog, in a blog, he said, what we're doing with, with Ethereum, uh, it, that's why, well, what we call Web3, what he calls Web3, is what their project that they were doing with, with Ethereum. It's unfortunate because we have spent so much time since then saying actually the web, web and blockchain is different. Okay, web, the, the third layer of the web is these, these protocols we built on top of it. It's not blockchain. Mm. If you, you could look at trying to use blockchain for a solid pod, suppose you want to you store that medical <coughs> data. On a, where you're going, you could put it on a solid pod. Oh, it goes over the internet, goes stored into basically into a database, into a file file system is out there in your pod. And uh, if you suppose you take that medical data and you store it on blockchain, putting something on the blockchain. Uh, first of all, the way the blockchain works is the moment you put it on the blockchain, it has to go. The same data has to be put on every single node on the blockchain. So your medical data has now been put on every node. What's wrong with this picture? Okay, it's, it's completely public. So the, everything you do on the blockchain, blockchain is public. It's, uh, it's also expensive because there are gas fees, you know, they call them. Uh, basically, the way blockchain is made, it, it, it works with, <coughs> you have to pay mm, Bitcoin to, to, uh, to put stuff on the, bit, on, on, on the Bitcoin. And, and uh, uh, they work in different ways on different blockchains. But basically, the way it works is you have to pay fees to get something. So do you want to have to pay fees? And also, it's slow. The whole blockchain process, if you actually, there are lots of blogs about you know, by developers who tried, who tried to make web apps that just store stuff on there. And it's, so it's public, which is not what you want for your medical data. It's expensive and it's slow. And we have to be the reverse. So mm. we, you know, we have to be but private by default and fast and cheap. Mm. And so, so all that blockchain stuff, some of them, you, there are things you can use blockchain for. If you, if you want to do something which is, which you, where you're happy to, you know, if you want to get a, a digi put a digital ID out there, yeah. a DID, you want to say, this is me, this is my public, everybody, this is my key, my public key, and this is my face and this is my identity. So we can, so that, that's reasonable because it's, it doesn't mind being slow. You want it to be public and seen by everybody. So for th something like digital identity, the blockchain is okay. Mm -hmm. But for but just storing data, personal data, doesn't, doesn't apply, doesn't work. So in that case, where do digital currencies stand? Because again, there is a there is a there is a group, a chorus of people who say, yeah. well, cryptocurrencies, digital currencies, tokens of some form mm -hmm. are really going to be key to what the future of the web looks like. When we're talking about tokens used for, you know, you've got companies that are offering sort of blockchain based cloud data services and you've got to use a token to use yeah. this, all this kind of sort of idea. What, what what happens in your right in your world? <laughs> you know, I don't care what they say. I don't know that cryptocurrencies are all Ponzi schemes. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that there's a relevance in, uh, in that. I think it's massively overstated, though, in terms of you know a, a new way for sovereign control over currencies that doesn't require regulations. I mean, you know, we're all reading the press, right? You see the implications of of technocrats who try and sit astride huge currency exchanges uh, and so on and it's just 
Uh, do you know, that's a, what, what, one of our number, I may have mentioned him to you earlier, off, uh, uh, Bruce Schneier, he's our chief of security. And Bruce has been very forthright, actually, in his opinion of cryptocurrencies. And if ever there was a guy who knows about crypto, it's the guy who wrote the book on crypto. I um, mean, you know, applied cryptography was the defining moment in crypto, I think, over the last couple of decades. So, so, so Bruce's opinion, and it's well, well publicized, is, uh, I think, consistent with the one I have, and I, I suspect Tim's too, which is, you know, we just got to be really, really, really careful we don't overreach with all this stuff. And, and the folks who are heavily invested in either from a commercial perspective, you know, investors, or from an ego perspective, because it's their baby, they designed it, will make massive representations in a way that's, I think, totally inappropriate for cryptocurrencies and the like. Tim, I'd love your take on that as well. I mean, with cryptocurrencies in particular, you know, there's many, as I mentioned, who say, well, this, this is very much part of the future of, of the internet, of the web. Um, and it's key if we want to achieve any kind of decentralization on the web. Um, you know, Bitcoin, a global currency, some say. <laughs> so what's your view? So I remember the dot-com bust boom and bust. I remember sitting there talking to people, people were talking about saying, you know, what, so why is the, what, why is stock of this, uh, this, this is a company that's just opened a website for selling, uh, for selling cattle in, uh, in Texas, but the cap of the market cap of the website is greater than the value of all of the, the, the cattle in the whole world. You know, w uh, why, uh, uh, people will say, why is that? And the only, uh, the answer, why was that the thing? Why was it value that? Because people were just valuing it because of what they imagined other people would value it in the future. So in other words, there, it wasn't based on revenue or in real. So the, the bubble came because the value, what you imagine, what you're prepared to pay for it is what you think other people will be prepared to pay for in the future. And so something like a, a, <clears throat> a digital currency where that's what happens, where it's not linked to anything, and it's only speculative. Obviously, that's really dangerous. If mm. People have had a. If you want to get, if you if you want to have a kick out of, of gambling, basically. So yeah, Bruce's book is good on that sort. Uh, basically, uh, if it, it's just speculative, it's less back. It's even if um, cryptocurrency can be 100% speculative, not linked to anything at all. Whereas at least that poor website about the for selling um, sell cows. <laughs> was, you know, it did have a, a revenue, even though you know, small. So, so that, so basically, there's uh, um, investing in in things which are purely speculative, isn't what the way I, I want to spend my time. Right. Uh, and, and and so, uh, but having being using it for remittances, that seems to me the most useful thing. If you if you right. transfer stuff into blockchain because you can get that immediately to your family. In Haiti, then that's uh, that's utility there. Yeah, that's utility in that. Just don't don't get, don't keep the don't keep the currency. Right. Get rid of it. Put it back into USD or something. Let's talk about some new technology as well. Then on top of what what you are up to, um, the the development of, of artificial intelligence mm. is one that's been fought over for many many years, and we're starting to see sort of some breakthroughs that are getting through to the mainstream. And one of, one of the more recent ones is, is chat GPT from yeah. OpenAI. It's caused a lot of stir in the corporate world. And also it's, it's just really hit the mainstream. Friends of mine. great family. to play with. Yeah, oh, yeah it's great absolutely. To yeah. I mean, just f from your view then, John, how important a breakthrough is this um, in terms of AI? Yeah, I, is it a breakthrough? Uh, or is it evolution, uh, you know, uh, in the sense of, uh, uh, you know, I, it's fun to go in there and, and play around with it and so on, but, but I dare say it was fun in the 60s when MIT first did, you know, their version of MIT. I mean, you know, it, it, it's an evolutionary path we're on. I think it, there's a cautionary note or two in there about the, the way it can be, well, I guess you'd say, weaponized. But, but great utility, I think, you know, sort of rudimentary customer support, customer service and so on. I mean, if we're talking about the chat GPT type constructs, I, I think are really useful. I, and not to refer to Bruce necessarily over much, but, but he wrote, I thought he wrote a good article, or the New York Times was published in the New York Times quite recently, about the implications of chat GPT. So AI generally, though, has got immense utility. But it's software, it's algorithms, it's coded, it's, it's written to order. Its intention is to deliver against the resultant aspirationally from the coders who wrote it, right? So, so I think we've got to be careful. We don't assume that what we're, what we're getting here is real intelligence. We're getting just a proxy for a load of consequences of algorithms that run and give you a resultant. And, and the tool has, I mean, GPT has been around for a while, so people have kind of 
have uh, pointed out the, the sort of the chat GPT where anybody can use it is actually is, 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 so it's not a revolution in the power of, of AI. Right. It's just a revolution in how of making it really easy to for anybody anybody That's to fine. use. And there are concerns. I know the folks at Google uh, point out that they've actually had that sort of power for, for a while, but they haven't released it because they are worried about it uh, being used for uh, for ill. For and obviously the ability to for deep fakes and s stuff is a is serious. And to build a f how do you build a system which will can do people's homework badly but can't be used for deep fakes in a spamming uh, phishing attack. So, uh, so I think there are uh, lots of issues around there. But in general, stepping back and looking, you know, we've all been trained recently to, to ask our uh, you know, AIs for uh, well, assistance, uh, digital assistance for things. When you ask, when you talk to an AI, it's worth ask it who it works for. Right? So when you, you know, Siri, who do you work for? Well, I, for uh, I work for Arrow, Apple, actually, I don't work for you. And so, so Alexa, who do you work for? Actually, yeah, I, you know, I work for Jeff Bezos, I work for Amazon. I don't work for you. So one of the things we've been thinking about to flip that around, when you have a solid pod and, all, and you, we can, you can run an AI on your pod, that AI will see, the, in your pod you'll have the stuff that you've bought from Amazon. It'll also have all your, but also all of your nutrition data, all everything you've eaten, is also have all your fitness data and your health. So in, in a way, when you run an AI on your pod, it's actually going to have access to much more really, really cool stuff than any of the other individual, the, 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 the things like Siri and Alexa that operate on particular, over these silos, because they are silos and they're limited. Mm -hmm. Your pod integrates everything. It's personal data integration, if you like, like enterprise data integration, if you remember that being a thing, it still is. Uh, data in integration of all the data within your, within your life and then run AI over that, and that is sweet. So we imagine a, we imagine a, we call it Charlie. Charlie. Ch Charlie is a Charlie is an AI that works for you. How do you? And so you know who, who do you work for, Charlie? Well, I I work for you. And what do you mean? I mean, I mean, I am legally I am your agent, just like your lawyer. And and so, uh, and so, uh, then oh okay. So in that case, Charlie, I will trust you with all. If you really work for me, I will trust you with all my data. And so I will expect you to, uh, to be able to be r much more insightful. And so, that's, uh, and so the power of AI is it all depends on the data. And to a certain with a solid part of it, there's always been, you'd be able to run da da AI on, on public data, and people would be able to run AI on, uh, on clinical data, just, just the clinical data, but solid part, you have the whole data spectrum all of the data to do with your collaborations and your coffees and your projects and your dreams and the books you're reading and stuff and all of your life then is in your pod and you run AI on that, that could be sweet. That sounds like, it's a bit like uh, Iron Man uh, where mm. he's got Jarvis, his own personal oh, is that AI right? system who just Tony kind of, Stark. yeah, Tony no, no. Stark okay, kind gotcha. of thing. So there'd yeah. be a lot of people I think fascinated and interested by that. Um, we're just we're going to bring this conversation to a close. It's been absolutely fascinating, and I want to sort of think a little bit about what the future looks like for you uh, both. As you've as we've spoken to all these different changes to the web, to the to the internet model, uh, to protocols, uh, and how our data might, how we may have more control over our data in the future. If these things come to pass, John, I'll start with you. They if these will. things come to pass, um, and, will. and what does that mean then for? the way that the power in the internet's distributed right now. We started off this conversation by talking about companies like Google yeah. and Facebook and others sure. who have large amounts of data, who um, have very strong positions in the verticals they play in uh, and across different areas. Yeah. What does this mean for, for them? Do, do you oh. see a world where they are out of business? Is that too far? They're really <laughs> smart people, right? I mean, they're well resourced, they're brilliant people. We know a bunch of them and they're really, you know, what. I wouldn't. Really, I, I would say this. You know, as I say, when I first met Tim, I was at IBM, yeah, uh, a company I'm quite fond of in various ways. And uh, uh, you know, that's been a high technology business for over a hundred years. Just think about that. High tech leader for more than a hundred. Think about all the changes we have in the last twenty years, let alone a hundred years. And how do they prevail? Because they're smart, they're well resourced, they change, they adapt. The, you know, they, and, and they realize consequences around them and they adapt to suit. Otherwise, they go bust. 
So that, so that notion of evolution, I think, we'll see. The, you know, the, the, the folks who we believe are big incumbents, sitting astride data models, uh, business models that aren't, you know, change. Actually, I think they're very changeable. I mean, you know, we've mentioned Facebook a bunch of times. And sure, their business model today is built out of how they, you know, we all know how they make their revenue. But, but they could change. I mean, my wife, I will tell you just as an aside, my wife has a fabulous business, uh, uh, photography business, and, uh, and she lives in mortal fear of what Facebook might do to her because they could kick her off and, you know, and then her business model changes quite fast because that's how she gets a lot of her custom. And, 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 and the group she's in are similarly. In, you know, but, but she would pay Facebook for the relationship that they could provide her as long as they weren't taking her data and using it in, in untoward ways. So, so I think, that, and I, I'm not a Facebook user. But I don't even know my kids are anymore. But, I mean, you know, if I were, I'd pay them the nine bucks a month but please don't take all my data and disabuse it, right? So, so give me the platform to operate on and, and I'll give you for compensation for it. And that notion of service delivery for fair compensation, that, that's a nice balanced benevolent relationship between a consumer and a service provider. And I think that the businesses that we would sit here and say might not be in that mode today could move to that model. Of course they could. Like I say, they're smart, they're well-resourced, and they could. So, so I wouldn't rule them out. I mean, I really, really wouldn't. I think that we'll see them adapt, and, but we'll see other entities emerge, just as we did as the, when the web first evolved, right? We saw massive shifts, actually. Businesses that evolved in, in a substantial way, not the pets.com, but I mean, the substantial businesses that evolved over time using the web in the right way. And I think we're about to experience that again. I hope that, and, and I would expect actually, some of the corporations we're working with will be, because they're smart enough to see what the opportunity represents and they're beginning to mobilize to take advantage of it. They're not stuck in the rut that we, we talked about earlier. And Tim, your view on that, the, the big players, I mean, do, does, does the nature of their power change in a world where, um, you know, solid pod is, is the gold standard? Uh, so, so, well, of course, the, um, the solid pods, and uh, of course, the, 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 it's not just the technology, it's always the technology and the, uh, and the policy. So, uh, and we were, as we were all thinking about uh, solid, meanwhile, there's uh, the, the GDPR people were developing uh, G, uh, GDPR. And in fact, one of them uh, came to MIT, one of the people who actually wrote G, the GDPR stuff, uh, prof uh, an Italian professor came to MIT, saw a talk about solid, and said, wow, if you know, the people who are writing the GDPR policy want the power that people will get through solid. So sometimes you get solid, you, you, you get, there's, there's a huge backlash and a lot of MEPs and, they, and, and, uh, and people in the policy space are, are, have been thinking about how, uh, so that, that how uh, if necessary, there'll be policy and necessary legal sort of back up to this, um, but, but the sort of, the solid, once people see the possibility of putting together the, the technology with the policy, then that will be, uh, then it will become, yeah, people will get just addicted to it. You'll get addicted, you'll start off maybe using something which is solid based, and it will be like the web, it's all about a number of things that connect to each other. So if you start off using it just for some neat, uh, uh, some game or some, you start doing some wordle on it or something, or you start uh, doing some, doodle-like thing about when you can plan a, a, uh, a meeting, but then you'll realize that the solid-based meeting, there's the things which you plan when you, with your friends when, you, when you're going to meet. Then suddenly, when you know when you're going to meet, it's giving you meeting tools, it's giving you video conferences, it's giving you things to, to help you write, to uh, track the agenda and the program and the minutes, and then it's helping you create a me meeting series and you're creating a club around that and it's helping you then form them up. So you have lots and lots and lots of um, of, for example, collaborative, I think, that, uh, collaborative t tools which, which people are building out there. So the solid world will become more powerful. People will realize that basically anything which works and doesn't give them data in their pot is kind of robbing them of the power. And so the bit by bit, it won't be suddenly, there won't be suddenly a day when everything switches, uh, switches across. But just incrementally and inexorably, everything, everything will be moving into this new, much more powerful world. Well, such a wide-ranging, fascinating and in-depth conversation. Uh, Tim, John, thank you so much You're for your time. You're very welcome. It's a pleasure. Yeah. Well, what a vision here we've got today about 
what the future of the web looks like, the internet, and how we may be able to control our data in the future. If you've got any thoughts, you can get in touch directly on Twitter. I'm on at Arjun Karpal. But that's it for another episode of CNBC's Beyond the Valley. Thanks for listening and watching, and I'll catch you next time. Beyond the Valley.